So what we do in terms of trying to take someone or ourselves as well from a state of uh, lesser awareness or lesser presence to greater awareness, greater presence is we use techniques that I'm going to refer to from now on as scaffolding. When you're trying to build a building, you can't build it without scaffolding. Scaffolding are the tools and techniques that we need to put up and then eventually let go of. That's also important once the structure is complete and we can then do other activities within that structure. Um, that's my answer to, to someone who says, well, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? And that's as true in your physical um, practice world as it is in the world of meditation or any other world we're talking about. The Tibetans divide their practices into milk, blood and bone practices. Um, milk and blood practices are practices that have a certain duration, a certain currency, and then they're put aside once things are real, once particular things are realized and then other tools are picked up. But there are some practices, and I would call relaxation one of those fundamental practices, um, which are bone practices. They do not change from a beginner attempting to grapple with these things to an expert who is simply re-experiencing those things. They don't change. And so, talking now about a meditation practice, there is something, there's a technique that I have found extremely helpful to, to know whether or not I'm falling asleep while I'm meditating or whether I'm actually being present. And that is a very old practice, which is a mainstay of Zen practice, which is breath counting. Breath counting is a, a, a terribly, terribly salutary experience, I'm afraid, because let's say you start your breath counting, and I should just describe to the audience what breath counting is. You take a breath in, and as you breathe out, you count internally one, and you repeat. Now, the first time, normally when we're teaching, and I am going to do some, I think we had a little conversation about this, I am putting together a little kind of cheat sheet or cliff notes or show notes for how to begin meditation because it seems those instructions they're not available anywhere uh, it, well unless you actually go on a retreat and lots of people can't go on retreats for lots of different reasons so i'm going to put together a, a sort of a a, a a simple start here do this do something else um what did you experience kind of thing and then go on from there but one here's a thought experiment we won't actually do this together because it would be most boring listening but you, you say that you don't give the person any instructions other than just become aware of the movements in the body that we call breathing. So not even become aware of your breathing because that's a concept. And that, that's, I have learned that you cannot use conceptual language in these things. You have to connect every instruction to a direct experience. So if I say to you, for example, take a breath in, feel all the movements in the body that we call breathing, that's immediate physical experience, right? And then the next direction is just simplicity itself. Just gently hold your awareness on those sensations. And then you give the class a minute or two. And then you and you've already given the instruction of increment the count by one each time you breathe out. What number did you get to? We'll say, say to the class. And no one gets beyond two or three before some thought comes into their mind. And I thought it's a bit of an, the uh, instruction I missed out on, you say, stop the count and go back to zero as soon as a thought appears in your mind. So I'll, I won't make that mistake when I actually do the recording, it'll be, it'll be there. And so what happens is you will breathe in, you're aware, you're connecting to those movements, you feel the chest inflating or expanding or however you describe it, or the tummy falling or the, the chest or the tummy rising or going out to the front, however you describe those things to yourself, you feel that coming in and then out. And then a little pesky thought will come along, something you're thinking to yourself, I must remember to pick up those zucchini for dinner. Let's say that's, that's the thought form. Oh shit, I just had a thought. Okay, I'll go back to one or zero, because start counting one again. And so the first instruction set is simply, the reason for it is simply to see how the thoughts come into the mind. Now, the Tibetans say we create 60 new thoughts a second. That's what experienced meditators claim they see. Anyway, so there's, there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously. But the point is, if you do decide to increment or decrement the count back to zero, when you, a thought comes into your mind, you will never get past one or two. 
So that's, that's step one in the practice is simply to be aware of that process. And second instruction is simply to do exactly the same thing, to become aware of the movements in the body and to increment the count and so on. But when a thought comes into the mind, this time, let it float through and keep your awareness on your breathing. And, th and that also then later allows the meditation teacher to talk about the primary object. The primary object in this exercise is to hold your awareness. And notice I always say hold your awareness gently on the meditation object, which are the movements or the breathing, or it can be something as, as fine as the sensation of the air at your nostrils. And it will, it'll depend on the student and, you know, phase of the moon and who knows what else, which direction is given to the student. But one of those things will be a useful meditation object because you carry it with you everywhere, your body, I mean, and you can immediately bring your awareness back to that sensation easily. And so for, for, for a beginning meditation student, it's a very good meditation object, I think. And so anyway, think... the, 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 the point about mentioning all of this and talking about beginning meditation instruction is just this. If you hold your awareness, at least part of your awareness, on the physical sensations of the body as they manifest, and, as, and you'll see in time that they manifest and then they fall away, manifest and fall away, and the sensations in the body are never static, that they are constantly changing, and that's a fundamental part of the Buddha's teaching as well, of course, and it's a very useful device to see that through. But the point is this, as this is the critical point, as you are aware of those sensations, you are not in the past and you're not in the future. You are only in the continually unfolding present, which in the beginning in your practice is an extremely narrow window. Because we, the mind jumps into the future or back into the past. Oh, I'm meditating very well now. That's a thought. Bop, bop, go back to start, so on. That sort of thing. The thoughts happen so quickly. And and as I mentioned, we're not that the, the instruction in our system is never to try to stop thinking. Uh, you'll break your mind. That's one of the one of the, the, the dictums that, that was I was given when I was a beginning Zen student. Don't try to stop your mind, you'll just break it. Rather, to become aware and this I'm going to talk about something which is a tiny bit esoteric now, but we were talking about this before. What we pointed to this before, what is the space from where can one's, the structure of one's mind be seen or experienced? What, what is that vantage point? Is this another bit of scaffolding? Is it a, a, a separate place somehow? Is it spatially and temporally different to the experience of thinking? No, it is simply a larger space within which thoughts are seen as, in the beginning at least, as somehow not the space themselves, but something that happens in the space. That's, that's as far as I would want to put some kind of verbal description on it. But the, the fundamental thing here, and this is the thing that I've been able to bring into the Buddhist teaching in Asia, is the space is far more likely to open up if you're deeply relaxed internally. It will not open up if you're busy thinking. It simply can't because the awareness is then tied into the thought stream. And so the only alternative to the thought stream that we have as human beings, although maybe Elon Musk will say, no, we'll be able to see it clearly from the moon or from Mars or wherever, but I don't think that's true either. The only vantage point that we have is from our physical selves, our physical body, if I can put it that way. Now, I'm not arguing that the space that I'm talking about is some kind of physical space in which the brain's activity is seen. I'm not talking about that kind of reductionist perspective at all, but rather, and I don't want to put too many um, labels on it because it's very likely that the next person who listens to these suggestions will do the practices and find that their experience is quite different and think that they've done something wrong. No. You don't know, you can't predict, and you don't know what that experience is going to be. If I just point vaguely, sort of like, sort of like this, it is that some kind, and even the word space might not be right, some kind of awareness manifests that within which you see thoughts. I remember Amatim, I didn't, I wasn't witness to this, but a famous teacher I work with was, he said, she said, 
all my children, she said in that lovely way she has of speaking, you're like the naughty fish dancing around on the surface of the ocean saying, I am the ocean, I am the ocean. That's a lovely story, I think. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I like about that story the most is that not bad fish or fish that have lost their way or any of those kinds of negative things that we have so hardwired in our culture when we're trying to correct someone. No, a naughty fish. <laughs> it's just a fun, yeah. a fun <laughs> thing, you know, a naughty fish. <laughs> so when you actually have that experience of seeing your thoughts or being able to, whatever the word is, I, I say seeing, maybe feeling as part of it too, because there's definitely a physical sensation associated with thinking, although it's so subtle that I think for a lot of people that, that that's not a strong connection. Seeing is probably the strongest. What happened to me personally to see my own thoughts in that way? Well, the surprising thing was, firstly, I just laughed. I mean, it was so obvious that this thought stream is it's the same thought stream that I had the last time I was sitting meditating and the same thought stream. It has the same flavor, the same recurring themes in it the same this, the same that. And you know what? Firstly, it's just not interesting. That was that was the first realization. It's not interesting. And I can put that weight down. I think I mentioned this to you once before, but when you become aware, oh my God, there's a lot more to this experience of being alive than just what I'm thinking. When you actually know that to be true, when you experience that to be true, there's an immense weight. I don't have to be this. I don't have to do that. In fact, you don't have to be or do anything. And when you know that, then again, it's just like not falling into the anger pattern. You have a choice. And if I, if, if there's anything to get out of what I'm talking about, it is to create the space inside yourself to have the choice about how to react. Because the majority, when we see anyone behaving angrily or falling back into depression or whatever the problem is, whatever the flavor of their own unsatisfactoriness is, firstly, it's a pattern that has been repeated 10,000 times before and you're an expert in it. And so there's a familiarity to it. There is an ease of bringing it back and re-experiencing it. Um, when you see that, when you have this larger space, you can make a choice. You say to yourself something like, oh, I know where that's going, or I know how this ends. That's probably a better one in my case. God, I know how, I know how this is going to go. Do I want that this time? No. And again, there's nothing judgmental about it. it. There's a lightness to it, I found, which was completely surprising to me because I was a very serious person. I mean, God, you wouldn't have liked me 20 years ago, Thomas, I tell you. I was just a terrible human being. Um, so serious all the time. That's another thing. So what, but that's what I've found is that, is that everything seems funny, and I don't mean you're laughing at other people or at things. It's just that everything seems funny, if, if I can put it that way. And again, the ego is not present. When you're having a real belly laugh, I'm not talking about a snide laugh where you're you know, enjoying someone else's misfortune or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. But when you have a real laugh, the ego is not operating in that moment. The ego can't actually operate in that moment, which is why we enjoy humor so much. One of the reasons anyway, because again, it gives us a rest from ourselves. And look, on the, on the much more mundane note, and then I'm, I'm going to stop talking, the, the reason for developing a relaxation habit and then possibly helping or get taking that into a meditation or formal, more fit, formal meditation practice, the best reason to develop a, a relaxation practice, in my view, is actually so that the quality of your sleep is enhanced. Mm. We spend a third of our lives sleeping, and most people's relationship with sleep these days is not a good one. In fact, I'm going to write about this and we'll do blog posts and so on on this as well, but not being able to sleep is probably the most common thing that people mention when you say, so, Tom, how are you? They say, oh, well, I'm pretty good. I'm not saying you, I'm talking about the archetypal Tom. But if you then ask, so how are you sleeping? Well, I usually wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking about this or that or something else. That's what I'm talking about. If the mind is active when you go to sleep, and this was my real reason in the, in the beginning for learning self-hypnosis, which is what led to my relaxation practice, uh, it, the biggest difference for me and the most important 
profound difference for me was it changed my relationship to sleep forever mm. completely it doesn't matter for me now if i don't sleep well in the way that people think about well i went i i became unconscious at nine o'clock and i became conscious at six o'clock so i must have had a good night's sleep you know what i mean no in fact there are there are nights when i am at least half awake most of the night but it's a completely relaxing experience i'm simply aware of what's going on around me and then when it gets light enough i get my body out of my sleeping bag so say you know what i mean it, the, the, the 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 key idea to get across here and i'm not perhaps putting it as as eloquently as i could is when you disconnect yourself from the immediacy and i've just realized my battery's about to run out so i'll just grab that power cord just don't go away sure. and i'll take this with me my mac is telling me that it needs some food so i will plug it back in so that we don't get cut off now where were we when you realize i, I was about to say something semi-profound just put it on the other side Remind me what I was talking about, Tom, before I was so rudely interrupted by the Mac operating system. You just finished talking about sleep, awareness during sleep, ah, yes. and quality of sleep. I'm not sure what you're about to say. Oh man, I'm disappointed. I'm sorry. <laughs> I um, wasn't paying. I wasn't paying attention. Yes, you were, because you, did, you absolutely had no idea where I was going with that. So, no. When this is this is how I would describe it in another context, but it will work okay here. And I have mentioned this, but I'm just going to tie it up to sleeping. When you realize that you're not actually your thoughts, when you absolutely know that to be true, that doesn't mean that your mind stops working or that you can't think or that you can't write or anything. In fact, all of those things work better. That's that's a fact. I'll tell you that. But when you realize that there there is a, an immense freedom is experienced and so getting back to the sleep thing you you're awake and you're aware i see that i've got a bright light in the background i'll just change, come over to here is that better yeah it's not the best room for for this kind of thing but when you're aware that you are not your thoughts and what's more what you're thinking about something is not necessarily good or bad or that that in fact then drives the experience you are actually freed from your thought processes in a way that the average person has not experienced yet. And don't, don't you think that, that starting with awareness of the body is a good, almost like an access point there? Like one of the, and we've mentioned the word tools a few times, one of the actual tools that I sometimes encourage students to use, and it's because it worked for me, was just, you know, many people are in this in this habit of lifting the shoulders, right? There's tension in the, and it's a protective it's a protective mode yep. and in particular it's cold now in Canberra. So it's happening even more. I say just every time you wash your hands and everyone's doing that all the time now, which is great because of the COVID stuff. Every time you wash your hands, just check what your shoulders are doing and they start, oh, okay, I can relax them down. Okay. I can relax them down. And I think it's uh, you mentioned the three heartbeats of anger, right? That your anger lasts only three heartbeats that the cultivation of awareness can be. It starts with a full day of unawareness. Uh, with five moments of interspersed awareness of whatever. It doesn't have to be awareness of anything in particular. Mm -hmm. And those might be the five moments of awareness that the shoulders were elevated and that you could relax them, which is two, it's two things, right? You notice something and you decide to change it, which you're talking about the choice. You have the choice. That, that is the development of a new habit that will change your life. As simple as that. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And and, and look, I know there's a, that, uh, it's a kind of a hackneyed saying now, but the Chinese um, or it's a Taoist saying, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The word that you used a moment ago is the perfect way to describe this access point. That is precisely mm. what it is. If you don't have an access point, no scaffolding, forget about building a building. You don't even know where to put it. You don't right. even know what the building's going to look like. So we we start when people get interested in these things. It's like everything else Western. They want to be successful at it. They want to be good at it. No, in fact, and this is this is actually what's wrong with our education system. We actually want to be bad at it. We want to fail at it, but aware of those mm -hmm. things because the fact is, and no, well, people who are educated really don't like this idea very much. 
You don't ever learn from positive feedback. You only learn from negative feedback. You don't learn anything when someone writes to you after a workshop or a course that you've done and says, look, that was absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much. You don't learn anything from that. Mm -hmm. If someone says, look, I hope you don't mind me suggesting this to you, but if you did this and didn't do that and something else happened, this would allow you X or Y, fuck, you think, okay. I can do something with that. And so our education system only rewards people being successful, which means basically regurgitating whatever the professor or the teacher has taught to them, or there are the prescribed texts which you need to know and so on and so forth. But actually far, far better is to make a mistake and learn from that. And I've been learning how to work with my hands, as in I've been restoring a boat. And so there are 10,000 skills that I didn't have which you need to have which I've had to teach myself. And the beautiful thing about working with your hands is you can see immediately whether or not Mm -hmm. the idea that you had about what is going to happen actually happened. Mm -hmm. And usually it didn't because you simply weren't skilled enough using the tool to make it happen. That's immediate feedback. And it's negative feedback, but which in the big picture is wholly positive. Mm -hmm. So getting back to what you were talking about, the body, if you are, if you become incrementally aware of what's happening in your body, you will automatically have an access point. Mm. And don't you, th- do you think, because my experience has been and that, that that becomes where the majority of time is unawareness or identification with thoughts, just absorption and whatever's happening, whether it's thinking or, or, or not. Um, absorption might not be the might not be the right word because perhaps that's actually what we're searching for, right? Is that that would be a way to describe the awareness, but mm-hmm. um, interspersed moments of awareness of how the body's feeling, how this part of the body's feeling. It's like a scale. The scale starts with just moments and then becomes more and more. Uh, it becomes smaller and smaller. So the awareness is awareness of more and more, smaller and smaller. M- feelings of tension in the body and then also faster and faster you know like you mentioned the shrinking of the scale from the word oh i noticed the word you're looking for is uh, discrimination Uh uh-huh by that i mean we there is clarity there's some sort of awareness and then that is just discriminated or distinguished into finer and finer things yeah now look, right. that's not that's not the sole description of the process because there are some schools of meditation that practice open awareness where we're actually trying to hold as big a space that we're aware of as possible. So we, I, I personally need to be very careful about saying it should be done like this or it should be done like that. The 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 expression you used, access point, is a, is a beautiful one, and and that's probably what I would like to end what we're talking today on because. As something as simple as becoming aware of of, uh, of am I holding my shoulders up or not that that doesn't sound like a particularly major thing, but it's the first step. It is the starting of the scaffolding, or in, as you said, the access point, and the access point leads to a truly limitless space in time, and so it might seem. And I've had people say, oh, look, no, I, I, I want to work on something more complicated than that. Because the, this is what the mind wants to do. We are so conditioned in our culture to be successful and to do things well, which plays into what I was just talking about a second ago. No, we're going to give you a small exercise to show you what the experience is like and what comes along to change that experience. Not that the changing experience itself is bad, but rather, what is the process? What is your awareness of the process that you're in? And in the beginning, it's not clear. But as you practice more, and this is the, the, the big point that I want to make, relaxation and awareness both are simply new habits. They can be acquired. Actually, we're all aware all the time. It's actually not that. It's the capacity to hold your awareness on something or to direct your awareness. The fact that we're talking to each other, we're both aware. So it's more than that. It's something, it's developing the capacity. Well, concentration is one of the words that's used in, in Buddhist teaching. But concentration to me, as a Westerner, implies a kind of screwing down of 
the focus. I, but it's not that. It would a better expression would be a completely relaxed or a gentle concentration. I like the word gentle because it's soft. So when we were talking before about letting the thoughts, we're not pushing the thoughts out of our awareness. That's an action, and the ego's involved there right away. And then straight away, there's the good me or the bad me. Oh, look, I was able to push the thoughts out of the way. Oh, the bad me, I wasn't able to push the thoughts out of the way. That's a dead end. Not that. Rather, gently letting the thoughts pass through, like watching clouds go across the sky. There's no good or bad about that. It's simply becoming aware of the process. And by that, I mean, if you do watch your thoughts for long enough, you will see the same thoughts coming again and again and again. And that's, that's a great realization. Just that is a great realization. Mm-hmm. They're not real. Yeah. They seem to be real. And certainly if you get stuck into them and get involved with them and then started creating new things on the back of those thoughts, you, in fact, you'll defend them as real. So it's all, yeah, keep an awareness in the tummy. That's a, that's a short story. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good trick, right? Hopefully you move from being, oh, I'm noticing tension, say, in the shoulders or in the tummy once a day to twice a day to three times a day to very, very, very frequently. And then the awareness is there kind of diffused throughout the body and, and the mind the whole time. Yes. And again, the thoughts, is just, I like the naughty, naughty you know, fish. Oh, you know, maybe yeah. it's every every couple of minutes. Ah, oh, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking through that again. Yeah. And, and sometimes you might choose to think the thought through, right, as well. Like, let me. Let me finish this thought. (laughs) That is a conscious choice. Right. That's different. So really what we're talking about, when we talk about thinking, what we're really talking about when we're talking about thinking in a negative way is, let me refine it, it is obsessive thinking. It is Mm -hmm. thinking that you can't put down or thinking that wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning every day without fail. You have no control over your mind. And when I say control, again, I'm not talking about screw it down tight control. I'm talking about the fact is you have no tools. You have never been taught anything about how to exert some control over this unruly beast who's only doing what it's designed to do. That's the thing. It's naughty fish. It's not bad fish. It's, It's really a profoundly important idea. And it really doesn't it. It defuses that. Because because as a culture, we are immensely critical of other people and as individuals, we are immensely self-critical. I know I was. And you could argue I should have been much more critical of myself because you are bad. You are, you are not a good person. <laughs> so anyway, so look, develop a relaxation habit and I guess we can, we can, we can link to some of the things on our site because we've got, I've got the recordings of probably 150 different relaxation exercises that I've taught in monasteries in Asia. And you can sometimes hear the, the monkeys in the background um, mm-hmm. in the forest because the, the, these monasteries are all built in forests. Uh, that's one place to start. But also to the other thing, and as we're both body workers, it's worth mentioning this. The fact is you can do all of your body work with that level of awareness too. That's a big, yeah. big, a big important thing. And so I teach all the body work on, the, on meditation retreats that I co-present or present. And the reason, and what I do is I, I present what look like ordinary stretching exercises, but, but I'm always pointing my students to, now just watch what's going on in your mind as you bend forward to try and put your face on your shins. Let's say you're doing a pike or something. Can you feel the resistance in your body? And can you are you aware of your own emotional response to that resistance? The experience of resistance is not just experience as resistance, but it's, holy shit, I wish I was a bit more flexible today because I've got an audience around me and I want to look flexible today. That's where the unsatisfactoriness pops up. It is immediate judgment. It's a, it, the filter straight away has separated the experience into the half that you want and the half that you don't want. And all the other things we've spoken about indirectly today can be experienced in that moment. And then the, the deeper one is, am I experiencing aversion, which is the most common response to a strong physical sensation? Am I experiencing attraction? Or is it neutral? So those three things that you mentioned before, they are in fact straight out of one of the most famous sutras. 
Am I attracted to? Am I repelled from? Or am I neither attracted nor repelled? As soon as you start looking at your physical work that way, that also changes the experience of that. It's remarkable. I had an experience with, and, and this is when I first came across your, I started making use of some of your, those relaxation scripts actually, kit, mm -hmm. which is my story I've told a few times before with chronic pain, I had, which started with injury and often, often it does, right? I had a um, spondylolisthesis, which, which you would know what that is, but um, for people listening, one vertebra slips forward of the other, mm -hmm. and there were two, uh, two fractures associated with that for me and then labral tears in the same in the hip on one side and a bone spur in that hip and all these diagnoses didn't do much for my uh, experience but mm. <laughs> of pain um, but I remember sitting in a in the physio's office one one day and I'd gone through all these kind of conventional therapeutic approaches and he said well are you in we're talking about chronic pain it's like it's every time I I just feel like I'm in pain all the time. And I didn't know I was in chronic pain at the time. It was a seven year span on reflection, but it was just being. And uh, he said, well, can, are you in pain now? And then I tried to feel, put my mind's eye into my hip. And I said, well, yes, yes, I'm in pain. But then I reflected after. And I think the moment before he asked, I wasn't, exactly. I wasn't in pain. Exactly. It, was, it was that the sensation of my right hip had become a sensation of pain the two things had become coupled together. Mm -hmm. And so I used, started using your script and other tool, your scripts and other tools to try to have the experience of feeling my hip without feeling pain. And I used my left hip. This is my trick. Mm -hmm. Well, focus your attention on the left hip because otherwise you feel, for, you feel for the injury or where you normally feel the pain and you get that aversion as well, right? Pain leads to tension. So I can feel pain and you try to protect you contract you go. it's a habit yes it exactly. becomes a habit and and what do we know about habit the most important thing to know about habits is the more often it's repeated the more deeply it's grooved the more mm. easily it's brought back the more easily it's re-experienced right and isn't it isn't it fascinating how these things are connected i, I just decided i'll stop checking as often how my hip feels and then instead I'll use, I'll check during the relaxation practice and check and try to couple the feeling of right hip to the feeling of relaxation rather than to the, because you have to, this is the other thing we know about habits is they need to be replaced by other habits. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and so, and so could I just interrupt there and say, um, you're at, that's absolutely, it's, it's really important to make this point is that relaxation and also gathering your awareness and holding your awareness on one thing or something else they are simply habits mm. and the mm. habit of being relaxed is just not the habit of most modern western people there's all sorts of reasons for it evolutionary and other reasons for it mm. but if you identify another state as being something you would like to feel or achieve you can do that now in spiritual work they talk about if you want to change your habits you need to do the new habit every day for a month and then they always pause and they say, but if you're really serious about it, you do it every day for three months. Mm. Now that, that, that does seem there is, a, there is something in this. I don't know what it is exactly and it doesn't bear analyzing too deeply, I don't think. But the fact is, the, the brute fact, if I can put it that way, is if someone does practice a new habit every day, even if it's only for a moment or two, for three months, they have fundamentally changed themselves at the end of that three months. That's the, the big take home there. Mm -hmm. And so we often have people ask us, are you in your field and my and me and mine? Here's a classic one. Okay, so I can't touch my toes, but how long did it take me to get front splits? You mm -hmm. know, this is a, a, a serious question. Well, mock serious. And you have the same thing. I'm just starting human training. I'm about 30 kilograms overweight, um, but I, I, I want to know how long it'll take me to do a muscle up. That's a classic one. This, really what that points to is the shape of the mind. That's what it points to more strongly than anything else. Very few people are inclined to just try something, feel what is happening, feel how they can change it or improve it or make it feel easier or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Or how can I exert more force in this pull-up exercise? 
How can I do that? No, no mind activity will ever help you with that. Can you feel the muscles that you're using to do this particular job? Are you loose enough to get into the fundamental position, which of course is one of the early ways, early conversations that we had. Anyway, I, th I think we're on the same page here. Well, and the terrible thing, it actually connects with what we spoke about in the very beginning, is that if the conscious, conscious, what we can pay conscious awareness to is relatively small, it's a small part of our experience, or the conscious mind is, that maybe that's a 1% slice of our entire experience. Like we said, you see the thing, and then in that moment, you've already made a decision mm. of some sort, and your mm. body's shaped itself into a certain position, mm. and, then, and then perhaps a flow of thoughts um, arises then that's what we should be. If we're interested in self-transformation, then it's habit. I mean, it's really habit development, isn't it? It's, it's cultivating your un, otherwise unconscious, you're bringing awareness to otherwise unconscious yes. traits or and, tendencies, patterns, and trying to shape them in a positive. And then, you, and then you're just in the habit of paying attention to that thing and you don't need to continue practicing whatever the tool you know the tool's done with the raft can be, can be tossed away right exactly um but but it's just uh, it's hard isn't it because the conscious slice that one percent slice of us convinces that is convinced that it's a hundred percent um uh, but and, it can't and, it can't and, be changed on its own and it's very convincing isn't it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Look. That. Look. That's probably a good point to stop on for today. I think, Tom. Mm. And I would. I'd be very. Well, I, I did in fact do most of the talking today. Forgive me for that. <laughs> but, but what would be interesting, and we'll put this on our own channel as well. But if people have any specific questions, mm. um, and we'll, as I said, we'll write some show notes about you know, where to get some relaxation practices from and that kind of thing. And I am going to write that, you know, how to start, how to act. I've, written, I've done that video, how to sit for meditation. That's been out for a long time, but not what you're actually supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll make some notes on that as well. And we'll link, we'll link up on that. But if I, a, a teacher that I work with once said, and he was quoting his own teacher, he, he said, you think you're enlightened? Go and stay a week with your family. Mm -hmm. Now that provoked a thought to me. I thought... There could be a discussion, for example, well, how, what, how do, supposing you, you find your mother really annoying or your father really annoying or he's on you about this or that and the other and that theme has not changed since you were a kid, whatever it is, how, what are, here's a word that we haven't used so far today, and this is a term in spiritual work, very important, we can explore this next time, but what are the skillful means for not changing that as in I'm going to change that person, but what to the person who's waking up, what ideas or attitudes or tools can I bring to this experience that will help it to be either smoother or a better experience for both parties concerned? Or again, I don't want to point to the outcome, but mm. what what are the to use your expression? I'm going to I'm stealing this by the way. I'm just letting you know access points. What are the access points for this? Well, there are. If you think about it straight away, access points. It's a very good expression. Mm. There, will, there will be access points. Mm. And how, how do we do that without becoming yes. detached exactly. as well? Exactly. Because that I've, I've gone through that experience. Oh, now, I, now I'm just not feeling, I'm not affected by anything. And that seems, seems nice until you start being affected by things positively and then you realize perhaps it wasn't. That's right. Or you're aloof. And actually, I would like to, maybe next time we can talk about the cat, the cat worship uh, I'd like to take you up on that because, sure. um, you know, that I, I do think there's something there that the dog has that engagement yes. that, that, that the cat could benefit from as well. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah, no. whenever, Just we talk, I'm, yeah. whenever we talk about those kinds of things as they're only ever thought experiments and we, because. for example, our own, the cat that who passed last year mm. um, was an immensely affectionate animal. Um, and mm. and was not like that archetypal cat I, I keep talking about, the one who, you know, if, if you're in favour, you might get an ear twitch, you know, mm. where a dog be having a different way. Anyway, look, we, we will talk about that. So, look, why don't, we, why don't we wrap it up for here today and I'll okay. make sure that I press the right buttons to save this, otherwise it's been a very pleasant conversation. Yeah, um, thank But you. what I was thinking of, I'd be very happy if 
our audience gave us specific things to engage with. So maybe some of the stuff that I talked about today might seem a bit airy-fairy. It's not airy-fairy, and, and as you know yourself from your own personal experience, but it might seem that way to someone who hasn't had some of the experiences that you've had or I've had. So I'd be very happy to re-engage with any of these things anytime because as a teacher, and I'm pretty sure you'll, you feel the same way about this, all we ever want as teachers is to be useful to other people. That's all. I'm not trying to tell people how to think or that they need to chant these particular chants or you know, any of that stuff that we see so often in this other world, rather just to be useful to other people so that they, so that in order to, or to provide, if you like, the, the tools or the scaffolding or have whatever language you're going to use for that, so that your own life becomes a bit easier, a bit more comfortable, uh, a bit more rewarding for you. Let, let's just make that modest offer. Nothing, yeah, I think that, nothing I, special. I think that would be useful. Because my impression is that you and I could talk for a very long time about very many things, and Good. that so having some sort of uh, structure, or someone someone else can choose which rabbit holes we go down. <laughs> and and I will say that that I talked about some min, some things today that I've never spoken about before on podcast. So I know there is some new material there as well. But this is something else that we we need to reflect on. The essence of both of our systems is repetition. And no one ever talks about that because it sounds boring. Um, But repetition is key. Repetition actually, repetition is the way to mastery, full stop. And so even though I've spoken about some things on this podcast that I've spoken about before, each time you reapproach something, and this also is a function partly of yours and my relationship and the effect that we have on each other and all those intangible things, you say something and you find yourself saying something about the same subject you actually hadn't said before. And I was aware of that a couple of times, at least a couple of times today when I was talking. So if someone has the reaction in their own mind, oh, I've heard this before, be aware that your learning has just stopped, or I should say potential learning has just stopped in that moment. And that's true for all of our students on both of our sides. We say to our students, if someone comes into our workshop with an excellent yoga background or an excellent Pilates background or some other background and they're they're a master in their own field, we say to the fullest extent possible, please set your own system aside at the door. Very hard thing to do, of course, because that becomes the new filter through which you are, you know, assessing everything, but to the fullest extent that you can, leave your own experiences and your own understanding and knowledge at the door and try to apprehend these things as a complete beginner would with an open mind or in in Japanese, in fact, it's the name of my old business in Canberra, Shoshin. It means beginner's mind, but it's a Zen term. It's the, the openness, the willingness to learn, the excitement about contemplating something new without any of that other stuff. That's what we want. That doesn't mean that we can't learn something and doesn't mean that we can't use our learning in future interactions and so on. It doesn't mean that at all because that's, again, what the mind jumps to. Oh, my God, if I leave my learning at the door, I'm going to know nothing. Actually, you'll know nothing but in the right way. Mm. You might be able to learn something new, in other words. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, if you assume there's something there, then the chances are there will be. Absolutely. And if you find yourself, that the phrase that I found most helpful when I heard myself saying, I know that, or I know that already, I think, oh, no, I've just, I've just stopped. I've just shut, actually, I've just shut myself off from mm-hmm. possibilities. So, and you've put, your, you've put your awareness either elsewhere or you've started criticizing. Yes. Relative to, your, relative to your frame. Yes. Now you're judging their, their, their spiel or their technique there relative to go. yours. Yeah, yeah. Defending. Yeah, defending, and we're, we're yeah. on that treadmill. Uh-huh. That's uh-huh. it. So that's, mm. that's an important... I think it's a good place to end. I think so too. So yeah. th- thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you for so much time. Yeah, right. thank you for your time, Kit. Great pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And we, we might decide to cut this in half because I think we've been going for about an hour and a half now. It's pretty mm-hmm. typical for us, and it's a short conversation for us. Mm. Um, so look, let me have a look at it. I'll send it to you in its raw form, and you decide whether or not you want to cut it in half. And we'll leave the end bits in because I've always... always I'm a big believer in doing things live and we, we have, we won't edit what we're doing here. We might cut it in half, but we won't chop bits out or when people are presenting things, they think, Oh my God, I could have, I could have phrased that a bit better or no, 
That's how I actually phrased it at the time. So just live with it already, you know, get over yourself. You're not that important. This is what I say to myself all the time. It doesn't matter. But in, mm -hmm. but in, the, in the positive way, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, it's, it's in the same sense that if we'd already prepared what we were going to say, then what was the what would have been the point? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I and I thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Come in. Thanks, kid. Deep thanks. <laughs>